I'm honored to be here today to represent the lineage of my father's family who came to America from Aleppo, Syria in the early 1900s. I plan to work on the lineage of my mother's side of the family next and hope to share that with you at another time. The Ancona family dates back to the 13th century to Jacob de Ancona, son of Solomon. The Anconas came from a town in Italy called Ancona, which is where they got their name. They more than likely migrated from Syria or the Middle East to Italy prior to the 13th century. After living there for many years, they migrated to Syria in the 1700s and lived there for about 200 years before making their way to America in the early 1900s. The Ancona family held dual Italian and Syrian citizenship, as did other community members that came from countries like Italy and France. These Syrian Sephardic Jews were nicknamed Frangis and were not perceived as the typical provincial Syrians. Further, they, appear, they apparently had additional protection under their citizenship, citizenship of their country of origin of the laws and how it applied to Jews in Syria. At the advent of the 20th century, the winds of migration for the masses were sweeping through Europe and the Middle East. At the same time, Syria was feeling the economic strain that the opening of the Suez Canal in the late 1860s put on the region. With declining economic prospects and the Syrian government initiating a new mandatory conscription to the army for the Jews whom held dhimmi status, all of this created an incentive to make the sacrifice of migrating to a new country with a new language and a new culture. Interestingly enough, the first Syrian Jews who came to America in the very early 1900s came with the idea that they would make some money in America and go back to Syria. But that quickly changed when they realized what the opportunities were like in America. For many, this migration did not happen with whole families coming at one time. It was commonplace for the sons or the husband to first get, come and get settled and economically started before being able to even afford have the rest, having the rest of the family come. This is my great-grandmother, Esther Ancona. Esther Ancona Shama's family held dual Italian and Syrian citizenship, and they were able to freely move about from country to country more easily than their Syrian counterparts. It was told to me by my great uncle, Danny Shama, that the family went to Cyprus for a number of years during World War I, presumptuously for safety. Esther attended high school in Cyprus where she learned the French language among other subjects. From what I understand, she spoke a number of languages. <coughs> Esther was also very proficient in playing the oud, an Arabic instrument similar to the lute. Here is Esther playing the oud in Cyprus. Esther came to America with eight brothers and sisters and her father in 1921. For some reason, the manifests indicate that the family split up on two separate ships within days of each other before reuniting in New York. Esther's youngest brother, age five, arrived at Ellis Island with the family, and as the story goes, he had some sort of parasite in his head. Because of this, they had to leave him behind in Ellis Island while they went to start their life in America. He soon died and they found out three days later. In America, Esther met her husband, Abraham Shama, my great-grandfather. Abraham, an only child, left Aleppo, Syria with his mother, Sarah Shama. They resided in Juanjo, Peru, for about six months before receiving the proper paperwork, paperwork that would allow them into America, which they finally got in August of 1921. These are their Peruvian passports. Here is the visa that granted them passage into America from Lima, Peru on August 8th of 1921. The two, the two came to America in hope for a better life and they settled in Brooklyn with many of the other Syrian immigrants at the time. This is an image of Abraham Shama next to his mother Sarah Shama along with the manifests from Ellis Island and the ship that they traveled on.
Although we are clear that Abraham came from Syria, from Syria, this document says that he was a British subject, leading me to believe that he too held dual citizenship for some sort of rights invoked on him by the United Kingdom. This was indicated to me by his two living children, Aunt Violet and Uncle Danny. Abraham and Esther got married in 1926 in Brooklyn. During the war, Abraham worked as a ship riveter at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. After the war, he opened up a clothing store in Atlantic City, and then a contracting business that converted heating systems from coal to oil. He died at the young age of 55 years old from a heart attack. These are their naturalization documents, which took them many years to receive. Abraham received his papers in 1944, and then he was able to apply for his wife, and she got her papers in 1957 after his death. Abraham and Esther had many children, one of which my grandfather, Joseph Shama, whom I'm named after. Joseph married Hannah, or Anne Hittery, and her father and mother migrated from Aleppo, Syria, along with their families. Anne's father, Jacob, or Jack Hittery, came when he was about eight years of age. He came to America with his father and other brothers and sisters. Here's Jacob's passport, issued in 1917. This is an image of the Hittery family taken in about 1950 in America. The bottom left, is Mary Kishk. The bottom right is Jacob Hittery. And the middle center is my grandmother, Anne. Jacob's father, Moses, Rabbi Moses Hittery, taught the young boys in the Talmud Torah. He was a very fine teacher, having known to remove his student's shoes in order to keep them seated. He would devote many hours after school to helping the kids. Being a rabbi, however, didn't bring in too much money. So he decided to start cutting hair to get, to get some extra money. Whoever couldn't afford it, he would let it slide and cut their hair anyway. I'm also fortunate to be one of the students of his great-grandson, Rabbi Moses Hittery, son of Bert and Lisa Hittery, who teaches at Halal Yeshiva today. He also had another great-grandson named Rabbi Ricky Hittery, son of David and Amy Hittery, who is very well known. Yeah. Once Jacob graduated the eighth grade, he came out of school to begin working because the family needed money. While the principal was against this, his father, Rabbi Moses Hittery, told the principal, we, we need money. And so he ended his formal education and took a job with a businessman who needed someone he could trust and could read English and write English fluently. Jack Hittery went on to starting a business initially with Mr. Charlie Mamie and Mr. Husney, selling textile goods in a retail store. Jacob was very smart, and his intelligence and good family name that went back generations landed him this job. Later, they had the idea of importing from the Far East, and so the company called Chinese Linen was born. Jacob demonstrated the sacrifice that the men had to make at the time to make a living as he spent countless months and sometimes over a year on each trip to China, going from city to city to find merchandise. The men would even sell things on consignment to new Syrian immigrants, and this allowed many people to get started without having a lot of money. There are countless stories of Jack and his children extending credit to other community members and immigrants with no collateral and based solely on their names. Jacob's wife, Mary Kishk, came to America as a young girl at about the same time as him. However, when she arrived, she had an eye infe infection of some sort and was required to stay behind in Ellis Island for about two weeks. Being alone in Ellis Island was miserable and she had no comfort of home, but eventually there were some people who spoke Arabic and she was able to communicate with them from time to time. This was indicated to me by her son, David Hittery. After two weeks of being there, she was able to come to New York and be with the family. Today, 
The Shama and Kona families and the Hittari Kish families extend to over 100 family members, from children to grandchildren and down to great-great-grandchildren, all of whom built productive and successful lives, giving back to their communities wherever they live. To leave off, oftentimes during Friday night dinner, when my family is sitting in the dining room around the beautiful spread of food and crystal glasses, my father will say that we are sitting at this table in this house purely because of what your ancestors did for you. By doing this research process and learning about how they lived and what they went through, I now understand what my father meant. Beautiful. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, you could find me afterwards or send me an email or text. Mary Ellen? Hi, my name is Marcella Dayan, and I'm a senior at Hello Yeshiva High School. I'm from the Syrian community of Deal, New Jersey, and I'm very thankful to be here slow. and excited. Slow. 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 Okay. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here to share with you guys the story of my Syrian heritage. So, the Dayan family are direct descendants of King David and can trace their lineage from ancient times. Here is my family tree. So on the, on the top corner is David Hamela, and down there, up there. My family tree. Okay. From the earliest times, the rabbinical leaders of the Aram Soba community were a part of the Dayan family. And it was for that reason that our family was referred as Mishpachat Hanasi, the family of princes. The native community of Aram Soba, also known as the Musaradim, were the first group of Jews to settle in Aleppo. My story begins in the early, in the, oh my, God, my story begins in the early 20th century when my great-grandfather's family moved to New York to earn a better living for their family and achieve the American dream. Many members of the Syrian community in those days left New York for other cities in America to make a living. My great-grandfather, Maurice Murray Dayan, did just that, along with his siblings. His oldest brother went to Seattle where he fell in love with a non-Jew and married her. His mother, Moselle Dayan, was devastated. She then decided to take matters into her own hands by calling all her sons back to New York and arranging marriages for each one of them. <laughs> she wanted to keep her family together by upholding the traditions of her heritage and her Jewish background. Keeping her family together as part of a Jewish community was her top priority. My great-grandfather, being a good Jewish boy, listened to his mother and returned to New York from Indianapolis after hearing the news. He met his young bride, my great-grandmother, Fortune Dayan, at the dock right after she arrived from Aleppo. So. Can you forward it for her? Thank you. Okay, that, there's my great-grandmother, Fortune Dayan. That's her American naturalization papers. And there's my great-grandfather, Maurice Dayan. Also his naturalization paper. Okay. The Syrian gov government would not issue her a passport, so her father paid off the Iranian consulate in Syria to get her an Iranian passport. Okay. Since my great-grandfather grew up in the United States, his main language was English, but his <coughs> new wife spoke only Arabic and French. At first, it was very difficult for them to communicate with each other. But as time went on, they fell in love and raised four children together. Their eldest child, my, great, my grandfather, Dennis Dayan, whose real name was Selim, followed in his parents' footsteps of valuing the community by becoming the commissioner of Deal, New Jersey, the town that I live in today and go to school. My name is Ariel Kochab, and I'm from the Jewish Sephardic community in Deal, New Jersey. I come from Halal Yeshiva, and I'm so excited to share my story with you all. <coughs> okay. So this is my great-grandfather, Jacobo Kochab. Okay. My story starts with my great-great-grandfather on my father's side. 
Nijim Kochab and his wife Frida Tuachi lived in Kilis, Turkey, where they had eight children. The family moved to Aleppo, Syria due to the rising anti-Semitism in Turkey during the start of World War I. My great-grandfather, Jacob Kochab, that's him, was a character. Even at 26 years old, he was very playful and he struck up fights with the Sheikh's son. And then during one of those fights, he actually popped out the Sheikh's son's eye and he had to flee Syria on a boat, on the next boat that came. So he didn't know where he was going. All he knew is that he was going to North America. So he, oh, cool. That was, that's my grandfather visiting the same place where my great grandfather landed in Veracruz. Okay, so this is my great grandparents. Um, Jacobo ended up arriving at Veracruz, Mexico in 1926 without a penny in his pocket. He found work unloading boats and made just enough money to buy bread every day. Jacobo made friends with important government officials by making arak and sharing it with them. They were so crazy for it that even when he moved to Mexico City two years later, they would frequently come to his house for dinner because he was a great cook and for his arak. Um, in Mexico City, Jacobo made sure to acquire a Jewish wife. He paid a hefty dowry for Frida Concha Cohen, that's her, um, the most gorgeous Jewish, Mexico, Jewish woman in Mexico, which doubled her price. Um, he, worked, he valued religion and did not want to lose his identity, so he worked hard to make enough money to marry her. Concha, short for Concepcion, is a Spanish Catholic name. The reason my great-grandmother has this name is because when she was born, her maid brought her to be baptized, and this was her legal name, and it stuck. So this is their wedding picture, and my great-grandmother looks pregnant, and that's because she is. So this picture was actually taken two years after their marriage, because pictures didn't exist when they got married. And two years later, when they got married, pictures were only for the high-class society, so my grandfather's government friends arranged for them to have their picture taken two years later. <laughs> Um, my great-grandparents had 12 children in total. They lived in a cramped apartment. They had 12 children in total, and they lived in a cramped apartment uh, where eight of their children were born. And when I mean that they were born there, I mean literally they were born in the apartment with mi midwives, because they wanted to avoid baptism from the Mexican government. <laughs> um, my grandfather Solomon was born in the crowded apartment on November 21st, 1939, at least we think so. My family doesn't know for sure, as in those times, the women would take three or four of their children at a time to get their birth certificates, and the women would tell the officials when they think their child was born, and that would be recorded officially. So, around 1928, uh, Jacobo opened up a fabric store in Mexico City. As his sons were born, he would have more and more workers. My grandfather Solomon studied in Benito Juarez, a Mexican public school, and he had a Jewish education from Jajam More Russo a rabbi who lived in the same area as them. He finished elementary school and went straight to working full-time at 11 years old. He worked at La Favorita, which is their fabric store, and they, there was a news article published about them. Um, his first job was to wash the front of the store and sell the scraps left from the big fabric rolls. In 1954, they opened another smaller store, Textiles La Estrella, and his brother showed him how to work alongside him. Jacobo taught them to value, value, to value family and made sure the brothers stuck together in business and didn't branch off to create their own businesses. That's my grandfather. Okay, so this is them drinking arak in the warehouse of the store. <laughs> he also made sure to continue their Jewish learning and sent the boys off to Titav after work every day to learn Torah and Gemara. He also made sure that the boys put on tefillin and prayed every morning, and each one of them still do so every day. These habits became part of their life, and they still instill it in their children and grandchildren today. So this is me. Whenever I go into Mexico City, I wake up early so I can pray with my grandfather. It's so special to see him wrap the tifilin straps every morning, and we share the same ancient tunes. And even though we're from different generations and different countries, it's like the same experience. It's so special. So as the family made more money, Jacobo was able to buy a gorgeous new house for the family. My grandfather still remembers playing trompo, valero, yo-yo, football, and baseball in the streets. And whenever the cops would come by, the boys had to run back into the house. My family always valued, oh wait. Nowadays, the house is a found, foundation and a prayer center. My family always valued their Judaism, and they wanted to share it with others. So the dining room, this was the dining room of their house. Um, so now all the, the walls are lined with pictures of the grandchildren and 
and everything, but now it's dedicated as a prayer center. That's my parents' marriage photo in the center. And then these are pictures of Jacobo's children getting married. Um, okay, Jacobo was known among the high class officials as well as with the merchants in El Mercado, the largest market in the world in those times. And in those days, it wasn't common for people to have ovens in their homes. So my great, my great grandfather would send his potatoes to be baked in the market square. And while they were baked, he would play dominoes with the merchants. And ever since then, it's been a custom in my family to play dominoes after every meal. And I mean, after every meal, we play dominoes. Um, everyone knew when my great grandfather was baking his food in the ovens because it smelled extra delicious. So the people would come out, ask him for food. And by the time he got home, there was none left. One Rosh Hashanah, so on Rosh Hashanah, the whole family would gather at my grandfather's house. One Rosh Hashanah, Jacobo was furious with his children. He heard that there was a Jewish man in prison, and he said that there should be no Jewish men who should spend Rosh Hashanah in prison. So he kicked out his children from the house. He yelled at them, and he said, until you bring this man out of prison and to my table, we're not eating. So they got him out of prison, and that was, that was his generosity. Even though he didn't know this man, he made sure he was at his table. On Friday nights, Jacobo and his 10 sons would go to shul and had a habit of returning with at least five more guests for Shabbat. Even when Concha didn't plan on receiving more guests, somehow there was always enough food for all. My grandfather Solomon says he remembers that his father was able to feed a whole table with just one small chicken. Somehow he would keep cutting and more would come out. He would feed the whole table. Um, my grandfather Solomon embodies his father's values every day. Okay. Um, in 1984, my grandfather donated an auditorium in his father's honor to help the Magan David Yeshiva grow in Mexico. Now, last month, he has re-inaugurated it. It is actions like these that bring him joy, as his father always taught him that the truest happiness comes from giving back. As his great-granddaughter, these are principles that resonate with me, and I hope to pass them down to my own children. Thank you. Joseph Asa. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm here to tell you the story of my family, tracing you through our history, from my great from my, from my great grandfather to myself. Okay, my great grandfather Chacham Yitzchak Asa was a very important man in the Damascus community. So just for you guys to get the idea of who he was, I want you to picture this. The conflict between Israel and the surrounding Arab nations is growing. Israel geniusly planted a spy, Eli Cohen, in the Syrian government. Eli, Eli eventually helped Israel win the Six-Day War, but he was eventually caught. He was tortured for information by, by the Syrians, and when, and when they decided the time was right to hang him, they brought in two rabbis to say the Shema and to give over his final words. One of those rabbis was Chacham Nisim in Debo, and the other one was my great-grandfather. Eli Cohen wrote a letter to his wife, that, that one, um, and trusted my great-grandfather to deliver these words. That is who he was. Born in 1896, my great-grandfather was considered a child prodigy. In his youth, he excelled in his Judaic studies, and the community was particularly impressed when he gave over his analytical, in-depth bar mitzvah lecture. In the 1930s, there was a shortage of mohalim and shochatim, who were circumcision experts and slaughtering experts. The community leaders chose my great-grandfather to receive training in these areas. He was sent by the community to Tiberias, one of the holy cities in Israel, to receive training under the guidance of Rabbi Meir Vatnin for over a year. He was so dedicated that when he heard he had twins back in Syria, he stayed in Israel. After about a year, he received his certification. Upon returning, he became integrated back into the Damascus community with the assistance of Chacham Nisim in Debo and Rabbi Yosef Dana. Upon returning 
to Damascus. He worked with Rabbi Ezra Tar of Masselton, the head of Shkita in Damascus, as a shochet. Along with being an expert in Shkita and Brit Milah, he was a tremendous scholar and religious leader. Noted as one of his greatest qualities was his humility. Whenever anyone asked, whenever, whenever anyone referred to him as Chacham or Rabbi, he would always answer, I'm not a rabbi, I'm not a chacham, I'm just a regular man like everyone else. The need for a rabbi and a mohel grew when in 1949, Rabbi Dana moved to Israel. To help meet the demand, he taught four young scholars the art of the Brit Milah, one of them being my grandfather and namesake, Rabbi Yosef Asa. My grandfather served the community just like his father did. He was a mohel and a shochet. Once a week, every Sunday, he would go to Lebanon to provide the community there with kosher meat and brit milah. My grandfather had the opportunity to leave, to leave Syria with my great-grandfather, um, but he didn't. He felt a responsibility to his community in Syria, and he felt that if he, if he made Aliyah with him, he would be abandoning them. So he stayed. He was a rabbi figure without the official title, and he performed Brit Milaz and Shrita, and Shrita for the community. My grandfather's choices impacted his family. My dad, Sali Asa, was born in December 1973, the second of five children. He had a normal life for a Jew in Syria. He went to the Jewish school, which was, of course, just a Christian school with, the Jewish, with you know, Jewish students. Um, he played soccer and just did normal kid things. That was until he was 14 years old. When he was 14, um, his family, they realized that life in Syria wasn't so great. Um, and they, they, had to, they had to come to America. So they had been trying to get exit visas for, for a few months. And then one day they received a letter permitting my grandmother, my dad's mother, and two of my dad's sisters... Um, to leave. Once, th once this letter came in, they had a decision to make. They didn't know if the other member, if, if he would ever see, if, if they left, if they would ever see, if he would ever see his mother again. Leaving America, uh, leaving Syria, could mean never ever seeing his sisters or his family again. My dad told me that he remembered crying in the airport, thinking he was never going to see his mother again. From age 14 to 18, my grandfather had to single-handedly raise my dad, my uncle Isaac, and my aunt Lucette. Three years after the family was split, they got another notice, after reapplying for visas, that my uncle Isaac and aunt Lucette could leave. Now, my dad is 17 years old, and he said he had a really hard time focusing in life and keeping a positive attitude. He felt like he would never get out. It was just him and his dad. Everyone kept leaving and he, was, he just had to stay. And he hasn't seen his mother in three years. A few months after his two siblings left, my grandfather and my dad finally received permission to leave in 1991 and reunite with the family in Brooklyn. After being a whole family for the first time in four years, life in America was hard. My dad, uncle, and grandfather were, all went to work to provide for the family. Not knowing a word of English, business was, was, was tough. To make a long story short, after many years of hard work and hustling, with no money backing him and no English, just 13 years after coming to America, he began construction on the first Casa Hotel, a 50-story skyscraper. <laughs> so my grandfather, being part-time rabbi, always told my dad to keep strong faith through the tough times and to thank God for the good and the bad times. These values of gratitude and community service were always taught in our home. My dad emphasizes that everything we have is from God. My grandfather also emphasizes being traditional. As a family, we all know how to chazan. My grandfather always emphasizes that we have to read, that we have to read the prayers ot by ot, letter by letter, word by word. He always gives us uh, a nice little cute parable. 
If you were standing in front of a judge, how would you speak? Quickly, mumbling? No. You'd speak slowly and carefully. He says it's the same thing by prayer. You're talking to the God, King of Kings. These values and beliefs have been infused in our family, and I'm so thankful and lucky to be a part of it. I'm so, I'm very excited to be able to infuse all these values into my children. Thank you, everyone.